we just try to tap maybe. I am leaving to get a black one. my drink here. Ah, well, that'll teach me to sneak in at the last second. Yeah, Rick surprised me by talking fast. I understand we've got a take here, then I get to talk. Russian launch went very well. They placed us within 400 meters of where they were predicting us to be, which is outstanding. I could ask for anything better. Aerospace history was made by a local company this morning when an experimental spacecraft blasted into orbit atop a Russian rocket. We've got some great news. It is healthy, it is alive, so.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to the second day of New Space 2006. I'm going to bring Rick Tomlinson up here in a moment to introduce our special guest this morning, Robert Bigelow. But before I do that, those of you who were here yesterday, of course, you'll remember I, I spoke a little bit in the morning about what is new space, what's the definition, and certainly uh, Bigelow Aerospace and the accomplishment of last week certainly fits the bill. So I'm delighted that we'll be hearing more about that. I just want to mention tomorrow afternoon at 4.30, we are continuing something we started last year, which is uh, sometimes referred to as speed dating. It's the Emerging Technologies session, which is at uh, 4.30 to 5.30 tomorrow afternoon. Uh, Mike Meeling is uh, in the back there on the right. If you have an emerging technology related to new space that you would like to present, I believe you would have a maximum of five or six minutes, which is, of course, why we call it speed dating. He has a number of people that have already uh, approached him about doing that, but we still have some more time to fit a few others in. So again, if anyone's interested, Mike Meeling, also referred to occasionally as Mr. Mojito. And uh, <laughs> there's a good story. There's a good story behind that. So uh, let me bring up uh, Rick Tomlinson, and we'll start the day. Thank you. Welcome to day two of the revolution, where we realize we should start at 10 AM in Las Vegas. Um, now, this is actually the time of the revolution where the, uh, the patriots uh, start seeing arising from their ranks the gentlemen generals and the people who are leading the charge begin to show up in, in big ways. And um, the tides begin to turn and the patriots start to feel hope in their hearts that they might actually win this thing. So um, today's speaker um, is uh, one of my heroes. Um, there's nothing like somebody who antes up whether it be sweat, whether it be, uh, you know, their time and their passion and actually getting out there and doing something about it. And, you know, when you open up your own checkbook that you've worked your whole life to build, and, and believe me, um, Mr. Bigelow has, has worked his whole life to build what he's got and get into basically changing the future of humanity. And I, I can't tell you how much I admire that. Um, I mean, he could be, you know, out buying spinners for his Mercedes so he could pull up next to people in intersections and go, look, they spin, they spin. <laughs> no, he's not doing that. He's, he's going for something bigger and grander and more important in the way of the world, and that is, is to, to create a great future for all of us and for our kids, and I, I, I really admire that. Um, Bob Bigelow started in the hotel business, uh, he and his wife. Um, if I understood correctly, actually uh, working out, beginning with sort of one of these no money down projects, um, which I'm going to start really watching those shows more carefully. Um, I'll be ordering the kit next week, you know. No money down. Um, and built himself up into, uh, you know, a, a very strong businessman with uh, thousands of properties here on Earth and is translating his knowledge of, of that kind of activity into space. Because after all, space is not a program. It's a place. It's just another place. And if you can build a hotel on the ground, you can build a hotel in space. Keep that kind of idea in your mind when you're thinking about this stuff. Without any further ado, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Robert Bigelow. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I, I wish to express my appreciation to Rick Tomlinson and the Space Frontier Foundation for this opportunity. Uh, we're very glad to be able to uh, be here and in the context of, of uh, feeling uh, elated over uh, the, our recent success. You know, I just bought a set of those wheels for my car. Does that mean? <laughs> <coughs> I don't know. Uh, somebody yesterday uh, or day before asked if I wanted to go to space, and I said, yes, I definitely do. And then I remembered uh, a thing, you know, I, my wife and I have had those discussions, and she says to me, you want to go to the moon? I'll send you to the moon. 
band. <laughs> there, there you go, you know. No luggage, don't have to worry. It's a one-way one -way trip, you know. But she's, she's an avid supporter of what we're doing. And um, so I, I uh, want to express appreciation to my wife on that. And the folks, uh, the Russian people, I can't say enough for. How they accommodated us, um, it, it just absolutely amazed us. The extra effort they went to, um, I, I had um, uh, wanted to have my wife's uh, name on our spacecraft, and we had gone to some effort, and, and I never had told her uh, that we were working on this for about five months, and, and get her name and lit up on the spacecraft. And, uh, you know, you need, as you guys understand this, you need all the brownie points you can get. <coughs> so, um, anyway, it didn't work for, for technical reason, and we had to take it off. And, but the Russian folks were kind enough to write her name on the fairing of the rocket, which is kind of cool. You know, we have a picture of that. And, and then, so the American flag's there, and her, and her name is there, and the, their company names and so forth. So, anyway. Um, I have about uh, 40 or 45 minutes, so I will try to move along. And uh, I want to, to especially uh, publicly uh, thank and express my appreciation to our company's terrific staff and our teams of folks. We have some fantastic people in our company. And we're a small organization, but we make up for some of that with the incredible enthusiasm and skills that we have among our, our group of folks. Um, we had a little press conference yesterday, and, and I didn't do a very good job of, of acknowledging two of the folks that were sitting on our little panel, because they had just come back from the Russian front. They had spent two months there, Boris Rabanovich and uh, Mark Pearson. And they were part of a team of folks that we've had over there for a long time. Uh, as some of you may know, we had a postponement of four weeks. Uh, in our in our launch, and so folks were there for much longer than they had expected to be. At one time, we had 18 people there, and um, the the feature that generates that and has generated that was the was the ITAR requirements by the Department of State. So there are lots of rules and regulations that are imposed and implemented on us and or on anybody that's doing these kind of things and. It has to be um, <clears throat> where you have to have a contingent of a lot of folks, security people and all kinds of technical people. And so they had um, spent over two months uh, there. Um, <clears throat> I want to say that uh, we have career opportunities available in our company. I want to give a little pitch here uh, since I have the opportunity to, to say we, we are still looking for more folks in engineering and we have other positions available legal positions, accounting positions, and so there's other areas besides avionics, robotics, and engineering that, that uh, we're looking to, uh, to fill. And we have <clears throat> two plants. Uh, we have our main plant in Las Vegas, and we have another very nice facility in Houston. So folks uh, could, uh, depending upon the nature of their, their position, uh, work in either, in either place. Of course, one of the <clears throat> key things in our company is our Washington office, and I can't say enough about Mike Gold and his staff, uh, Courtney Stad, and other people that are a crucial part of our activities. And I, I tell folks, you know, this isn't the, the technological challenges are huge, and God knows they 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 are all you know. There's so many silver silver bullets in that group, but. Even having said that, in, in my way of thinking, that is not on the top of the list of what really hurts you. What's on the top of the list is politics. If you do not have the political environment or political permission to conduct an activity, it doesn't make any difference about all the rest. That's number one. That's what our Washington office struggles for every single day. I think next in line is management. I think what's characterizing the new group of folks, and somebody yesterday talked about, well, comparing to the, 19, the 90s, <clears throat> when there were other efforts, the Iridium effort, satellite uh, constellation efforts, what's changed, what's different? I think what's different is that you see some of the current folks, uh, like ourselves, that are really business people, that are populating this new, um, this new spirit and new effort. 
Bert Rutan is a businessman. Yes, he's an aeronautics genius. That's for sure. But he's also a damn good businessman, or he wouldn't have survived as long as he has. Uh, Elon is Elon Musk of SpaceX. He's a businessman, first and foremost. And that really means that managing people, managing money, is critical in this business. It's, it's a lethal activity that we're involved in. It's, it's hurt a lot of people physically. It has hurt people financially. It has busted and broken companies. Uh, we all know those stories. But um, here comes one of the famous men of all time, Buzz Aldrin. Dr. Aldrin just walked in here. Uh, He's my hero, that guy right there. I, so what, I think what characterizes the new movement is, is a philosophy that's different. I think we see where, where we now are looking for um, not just technical solutions. We're looking for business solutions. We're looking for folks who bring to the table, in addition to maybe their own capital, but a certain instinct for business survival. An, an ability to recognize um, what, how you need to manage money, especially, how you need to manage folks, manage people, and, and then uh, the, the technological aspects of it follow. So uh, <clears throat> that, that, to me, is the kind of the priority of order, politics, um, management, money itself, and technology. If you have a, if you have a lot of money, it, it, but you don't have management skills, you can blow through a, an awful lot. And we've in different agencies and, and so on. So, um, so as a company, we there's a small group of folks. We kind of know this this community because there aren't uh, all that many people uh, um, involved in this spirit in America. And so we need to stick together and pull together and try to make things happen. Our focus is on the destination um, side of the coin. We are extremely upon the transportation systems, we recognize that. So we have a five-year agenda that's predicated on many flights, perhaps six to ten flights of a Pathfinder demonstrator flights between now and over, over the next four or five years, leading up hopefully to full-scale activities. So as uh, what I would, I would like to uh, announce also that uh, Bigelow Aerospace can actually, right now, fly your stuff. This program that we've initiated that we're excited about and we can fly people's uh, pictures that uh, they, they uh, photo, they, they use a digital photo uh, a camera to, to uh, photograph what they're, they're sending us and then we, they email those pictures to us and then we uh, convert those to um, appropriate uh, cards that are about three by five inches and we're going to be flying those and we've used our own pictures and other symbols pigs on this first Genesis 1 flight to see if we can, in fact, uh, do that, and, and we do think we can. And we also are able to fly little golf ball sized objects for folks. And um, so that's kind of exciting. So if you want a ride, um, we can give you a ride of sorts. So come on, join our adventure. We're, we're uh, excited about it. Our confidence as a company will increase as successes mature. Our spacecraft program will be focused on the struggle to evolve toward the goal of creating a full-size module that can sustain up to six people for years at a time in extreme environments such as low Earth orbit, deep space, or the lunar and Martian surfaces. Of course, concurrent with this is the necessity of developing, testing, and demonstrating common berthing and docking nodes. That's a big deal. Uh, in addition to our other hardware challenges are the large propulsion buses and all of the rendezvous software. Those are also major, major components. With each spacecraft will come more challenges. Each additional spacecraft will be increasingly complex, trying out new procedures, new hardware, new systems, additional hardware and additional systems because of the redundancy factor, while at the same time, while all the time, these architectures will be evolving towards larger and larger structures. And on top of this, in addition, it, our mission control facilities will be further taxed by having to manage communications with multiple spacecraft simultaneously, 
since each spacecraft is designed and expected to stay aloft if it reaches the proper orbit uh, for approximately five years. And we're on a schedule to fly approximately every six months. So over a two and a half year period of time, in theory, we could have um, maybe five spacecraft that we're tracking. And we have multiple ground stations that are, that are performing those, those tracking activities. We have one station that uh, has been loaned to us by a subcontractor in Arlington, Virginia, which will be going offline for us in, in a, a week or so. We have our main facility uh, in Las Vegas. We have another one under construction in Hawaii and another one in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. So those other two stations will supply us with additional feed um, in about uh, maybe four months' time. Should be in time for our second flight, which we're looking to launch later this year, late, late this year, which I hope to be there for, for that particular one, which is out of Russia, of course. All these are, are flown on Russian Nepers, which is an SS-18 uh, ICBM. It's uh, part of the fleet of vehicles. They have altered <clears throat> and removed nuclear warheads, and they are using them for commercial purposes, which I think is a pretty damn neat way of, of utilizing th that facility. So in addition to all of this, we have other programs. Um, we have a program that in, involves a choreographical studio production kind of thing with the Fly Your Stuff program. So that's a process of downloading and transmitting select pictures and video. And that's done on a, da a daily basis, even a morning and afternoon basis. Uh, our mission control facility is operated uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So these, these are intended to supply entertainment, participation kind of, of activities and programs and games to facilitate website public attraction in order to create world public and corporate business and community interest and support. So during all of these flights and other activities will be the creation and implementation of the early beginnings of some of the economic foundation that we're, that we're playing with and that we're trying to, to uh, formulate. But how to create sustainable and adequate income streams is very, very experimental for us at this time. An additional hope of ours is that this public outreach program will increase the public's interest in space. And in addition to creating potential business opportunities, will also help to produce a collateral effect of a more relaxed and comfortable political environment over time. Of course, all politicians sway in tandem to the directional winds of public emotion and special interest groups. If the private sector can acquire and sustain interest, then why not expect a significant or at least potential, potentially significant positive political reciprocal? And if destination costs and transportation costs are reasonable, in addition to, of course, being safe and reliable. Governments should be fairly predisposed, maybe even some anxious, to contract for these services. In our case, we hope to promote a significant expansion of professional astronauts worldwide. This is another one of our programs that has already begun. We envision a time, not too far away, perhaps 10, 12 years, when maybe 60, as many as 60 or 70 countries will have active astronaut corps and space programs. We recognize how restricted and how limited the situation is with one destination, with a very expensive situation, uh, with a, a set of rules of accommodations that are not customer friendly. It's, it's, it's a dictated situation that restricts uh, the occupancy of that structure to a very special, small group of participants, dominated primarily by Russia and the United States. So you have a huge <laughs> rest of the world sitting on the sidelines. Once in a while, somebody else gets to fly. Once in a while. 
So there are about 350 astronauts or so worldwide at this time. Uh, there's no real reason that if, if you can't have affordability and user-friendly dynamics that you can increase that by 15 or 20 times over the next 10, 12 years. Now, some big ifs, but never. So each of these countries could, should <clears throat> be motivated in order to stay abreast of the competition, perhaps in the growth of space sciences and from a standpoint of image enhancements. Why then now? Because the engine, perhaps, of affordable and multiple destinations might be fairly close to reality, and so perhaps that other critical companion, transportation. Multiple destinations that can be easily leased, and we're looking model because it saves someone having to come up with a whole lot more money in terms of purchasing. We're going on the, the, um, the philosophy and the methodology that Rick alluded to in the terrestrial world of, of real estate development where you're building a regional shopping center mall or a 70-story office building or whatever. Um, we look at ourselves as providing that facility, having the responsibility of maintaining it, and um, not necessarily being involved as a company in the activities of other companies or countries doing things on board. So we're, we're trying to provide, um, and, and the banking world understands that very well. If you are um, <clears throat> developing a, a regional mall, the first thing you're going to do is go out and find your anchor tenants, and you're going to engage into uh, lease agreements with earnest money deposits and various for the, the uh, customer, for the tenant to, to uh, use if necessary. Um, you're going to be um, using a variety of, of principles that the banking world has understood well for, very well for decades, globally. And uh, so I think we have a mixture of terrestrial uh, real estate adaptations and marine adaptations. Um, in, in, in this whole effort from a financial standpoint and from a, a business standpoint. Um, <clears throat> these multiple destinations can be leased and, and if there is affordable transportation to them, uh, this, this can happen. All of these astronauts, perhaps globally as many as five to 7,000, which is a huge number now to us, will be taking turns training and working in leased space complexes. These same astronauts will be looked upon for private and government cor uh, cor uh, corporations to hire specialists to operate portions of space complexes servicing corporate and public agendas. Much as the same as military, as the military has supplied for years the commercial aviation industry. So hopefully Bigelow Aerospace will need to start thinking about hiring from this group perhaps in about four years. Our agenda is in maybe five years from now to be in a position to launch the first full scale. That needs to be a human-tended uh, situation, which means it would be visited. It may not be occupied continuously, but it would be visited to establish, uh, uh, make sure that the systems are operational. And, and um, uh, after that has already been determined robotically, there's only so much you can do. It, there's, there's no substitute for the human interface. Um, so. Um, after we deploy the first full scale, <clears throat> BA-330, the 330 stands for 330 cubic meters. That's a volume. Uh, the ISS initially was supposed to be 1,100 cubic meters. They cut it in half to 550 cubic meters, and I think that's where it remains. So one module at 330 is a sizable relationship to the 550 meters of the ISS. Um, so we intend to, to birth a, a, a second BA-330 about 18 to 24 months later. In between those flights, we have to launch a large propulsion bus. The common berthing node is attached to that, and so it takes a heavy lifter for all of these flights, expensive damn flights, all three of these things. So you start off with a HAB module first, and then you do a propulsion bus with a node second, and then you fly another. You're, you're robotically attaching these things and mating them together, uh, and, and you're mating those first two with a third one. Somewhere in our, <clears throat> maybe around the third, third to fourth year from this point of operation, we are going to have to engage in Pathfinder um, docking and rendezvousing efforts. 
and uh, we will outgrow uh, the Nepper launch vehicle at that time. The Nepper is capable of handling the first two generations, the Genesis and the Galaxy launch vehicle. The Galaxy will, or spacecraft, the Galaxy will be launched about this time, hopefully next year. And that starts the second generation. The quality of that is significantly uh, further along toward embodying the full-scale architectures and systems that, that we're going to be uh, concerned with. Um, so if you look at, um, we expect in our, if we can get to a point of deploying the, the, these three heavy lifter launches of the propulsion bus and the two other modules, in our third year of operation, from that point forward of being able to, counting the being that we have uh, some periodic visits to the first structure, in our third year of operation, we estimate that we will need 20 launches. We need 16 launches for people uh, and four launches for cargo. And these 16 launches, we've, we've talked a lot about this over the last year. We visited a lot with, uh, uh, many times with, with one company in particular and a second company secondarily. Uh, and we're very, we would be most happy if a, a uh, crew uh, return vehicle and, and uh, hab vehicle for transportation purposes could carry eight people. The, the, the artifact of eight people is really a function of, of cost and it helps to reduce the, the seat cost. If you can still have an affordable seat cost and fly five people, well that's fine. That's fine. And, but the, the more seats you're able to provide, and if you have a five meter fairing, uh, I mean a five meter uh, diameter on the, on the crew return vehicle, you can accommodate eight folks in that uh, architecture. Uh, and that can fly on a system that's uh, like the Atlas V 401 or 402 series, or uh, it could fly perhaps on, uh, on the Falcon 9 if uh, Elon is, is mine to to do that, uh, but nevertheless, the bottom line is the seat cost is critical. So um, <clears throat> 20 launches is a heck of a lot of launches, but uh, we, we, we estimate that that fits very well, our profile. Now that's a lot of money, it's a lot of cost, it's a lot of revenue for somebody. If the launches were to cost, let's suppose $8 million a seat, pick a number, and that's not just an arbitrary off the top of our heads, it's actually a number that we've looked at for quite some time with folks. But let's, and that's in 2005 dollars, by the way. So if you adjust that for inflation, uh, between 2005 and the time that uh, the event actually can happen, um, let's say you have a 65 million dollar launch. Well, that's a billion three hundred million dollars for 20 launches. So you're talking about some substantial bucks here, and and it's a substantial, uh, potentially a, a an industry that hopefully is about to happen, maybe. So um, uh, we're very much involved in the business side of things and, and the economics. Um, I wanted to uh, briefly mention that um, in the ITAR category, we have acquired a, 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 a good relationship uh, with a lot of the folks in the Department of State, and as you know, is the International Treaty on, on Arms and Munitions Rules and, and uh, so it's, it, but we still recommend, we would like to see that um, handed off from the Department of State to, to the Department of Commerce where it initially was cared for. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it is something that everyone has to deal with, so those of you that um, are struggling with that, we, we uh, feel your pain and really uh, understand that those difficulties. In the, in the category of space tourists, I think everybody talks about space tourism and I think that's going to happen. Uh, our, our philosophy is uh, we look at a path that has already been created by, um, hun from hundreds of years past by uh, ocean going uh, ships and the, the main purpose for those ships being created and financed was for either exploration purposes cargo. And so there was cargo being taken from one place to another initially and passengers were just literally along for the ride. 
uh, from an income standpoint and, and a business standpoint in our sense because of the, the huge amount of dollars <clears throat> that have to go out for launches as well as for the development of the destination as well, you can't really depend upon any one income stream. One of the uh, valuable experiences we're trying to gain over the next four years is a, is a thorough understanding of what income streams can be generated from a robotic application and, and how far can we take that worldwide in, in various kinds of ways. And there, there's quite a few different kinds of ways. So back to the, to the tourism aspect, I think that um, tourists will be a relatively small population uh, for a few years. First of all, it's going to be very expensive. Whether, whether we're interfacing with somebody as a, as a tourist client or there are space adventures or other companies um, who are gathering those customers and, and uh, uh, initiating those uh, space flight uh, trips. And so it comes down to, well, from a people standpoint, it's probably the professional astronaut community that represents uh, to us, in our thinking, the, the largest by far single body of, of opportunity revenue-wise. And that's why we're trying to think about promoting uh, space agencies among countries who have uh, little or no uh, activity in that, in that regard. <clears throat> I think the pricing uh, for space tourists are going to be, uh, have to be far less than it would be for the ast professional astronaut community. Uh, we, we have run different models on that and, and so the space tourists, if, if they were to pay uh, something and maybe perhaps eight million dollars uh, for a trip, in fact our company would not receive any, anything. Uh, uh, I spoke about this briefly yesterday. We would not receive theoretically anything out of those dollars. Uh, that will all go to the launch provider and for the recovery of the launch vehicle and for training purposes and so on. Um, we'll probably put that tourist to work when they get on board. They're probably going to be tending different kinds of, uh, they may be filming, may be tending different kinds of plants or, or, or other kinds of uh, uh, experiments and things on board like that. Uh, our, our focus, obviously, is going to be to try to make every experience special, and uh, we will assist and work with whoever the companies are that are promoting uh, tourist trips and trying to work with making those uh, a uh, fantastic experience in addition to the experience that's already fantastic. Um, we've covered ITAR a little bit. We've talked about tourism. Uh, we have... Uh, We've been a, a space flight company for only one week. <laughs> we don't know a hell of a lot. We're learning as we go every hour, every day. Uh, we are having to really dance. This is our first rodeo. And you know, it, it's, uh, our success has been as though you've gone to the uh, National Rodeo Finals here in Las Vegas and you've never bulldogged before, you've never done barrel racing, you've never uh, done calf roping and you wind up uh, winning in all of those categories and that's what we kind of feel like and we can't believe it. We have to pinch ourselves to really believe that this is happening and uh, we, were, we were so prepared and psyched for problems more and, and, and the problems are no doubt going to happen. I believe that Murphy is alive and well and, and I think that that is going to happen. But uh, we're, we're trying to to mitigate that through the, the volume of flights. Flying every six months is a, is a very aggressive schedule. Uh, without the Russian help, we couldn't do that. It would not be financially or physically possible to do that without the Russian help. So um, uh, that, that's our way of, of uh, trying to admit that uh, we sure don't know uh, at this point. Uh, future is going to be and uh, we don't take anything for granted. We're, we're looking over our shoulder. I can tell you that right now our mood and our attitude in our company is that we are looking over our shoulder. We, we uh, feel the hot breath of, uh, of challenge on us and that, uh, that kind of pressure. Um, so we take everything very seriously and we don't, we don't take, this, uh, take this lightly. Um, <clears throat> some folks have asked us, well, what do you Petition. Have you uh, uh, thought about that, whether it's domestic or foreign? And we have. Uh, 
uh, we're, I, we think we're probably a, a very close cousin to the world of the internet and, and computer world because supposedly that changes uh, <clears throat> um, every 18 months in terms of doubling the information capacity and I've got a close friend over there, Jacques Vallée, who's spent his life in the computer world and he he's a prof uh, knows that far better. Than but um, I think because of the frequency of our flights and how fast we're moving that uh, changes are going to happen also very quickly for us in this in this case. So I think that what we are going to have hopefully is a lead that we've acquired up to this particular moment. The question then is can we sustain this lead? Can we continue to invigorate the architectures toward uh, full scale? Can we have successful flights? Can we not get bogged down in in uh, various kinds of minutia, can we make quick decisions, um, and as are, are we going to be successful not only from a technological standpoint but political standpoint? Um, there's there's plenty of of uh, if you were a pessimist, there there's plenty of things to worry about, but we're not pessimists. We're optimists, or we wouldn't be crazy enough to be doing this kind of thing. So we think that if we continue to move quickly, we can stay reasonably ahead of competition over the years to come. They may come from overseas, um, and, and we may experience that uh, earlier than we think. We have no idea. We have, we have absolutely no idea. I had with me some, um, <clears throat> and, and I don't know how much more time I have. Uh, can somebody tell me? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> There was a, I, um, one of our really key people, Jay Ingham, had prepared for me uh, a, a short description of the, of the f spacecraft's uh, flight characteristics and behavior, and I can, I can read this uh, real quickly if you're all interested, uh, and, you know, as to what happened on the, on the day of launch, which was an exciting time. We had Mike Gold, our, our, our key uh, legal beagle uh, over there in Russia, doing the countdown for us, and at the last minute, we, we wound up getting a feed, a live feed. We didn't expect because one of our security people happened to have a laptop situation that worked uh, for us and so it was uh, a big surprise and we got this countdown going on <clears throat> and we have a successful launch and everybody's cheering and holding our breath and, and uh, so anyway the, the Genesis 1 was launched uh, at 7.53 Pacific time uh, on Wednesday July 12th. It took about 15 minutes to insert the Genesis module to a 550-kilometer orbit. Um, the first opportunity for us to contact the Genesis would be 616, uh, hmm, that can't be right, after launch. Oh, six hours and 16 minutes. Okay. Um, I, th I thought it was 06. So it was six hours and 16 minutes after launch, and we were really very antsy, pacing back and forth. It's a birthing process. You feel like a father through this and you're, you know, somebody else is going through the pain and that, but uh, you're still antsy and you feel this and, and, then, <clears throat> and then it just starts. Then you've got this little baby out there up in the cold atmosphere 550 kilometers away and you've got to take care of her. And it just has just begun. Now, we, you know, this was eight, nine days ago, and, and so she's still up there. We think in the feminine context, I think, at least I do, for a spacecraft. And, uh, and the Genesis 2 is a sister to Genesis 1, virtually identical except for a few uh, bells and whistles and changes that we're doing interior-wise. Um, but uh, so, so you do have that kind of <clears throat> the feeling of, of anxiety, and then it happens, and then it's, oh my God, how do we take care of her? And you worry about all those kind of things. Um, so the, the procedure, we, we, had, we started to initiate a program. There was a program deployment process asked about that and, and that was an automatic procedure that started about 15 minutes after separation from the fairing from the launch vehicle and we uh, began to boot up the cameras. Uh, we were required to wait 90 minutes um, before, uh, after separation before any solar array deployments and the worry about that was that the solar arrays were going to cause drag and <clears throat> for a long time NORAD was tracking two vehicles and I thought oh my god a UFO has actually started to, to pay attention to us, but we weren't so lucky. 
it was just our vehicle and the propulsion bus. And the fear was, the concern was that deploying the solar arrays was going to cre create enough drag to maybe uh, encounter that object, and that would be a, a catastrophe. So we waited an hour and a half before we deployed those so that we could have some separation from those structures. Um, <clears throat> so um, we began to take pictures early on. At that point about yesterday, somebody asked how many uh, photos have you taken, and we've taken about 500 uh, photographs at this point in time. Uh, most of those have been through the UHF and VHF antennas, not the S-band antennas, um, and I'll get into that in just a minute. Um, so we went through various kinds of sequences. Um, in fact, we had a power outage. <clears throat> Virginia, uh, Arlington, Virginia, as luck would have it, was uh, going through a violent sun thunderstorm right before, and they were our first receiving station that, that we, Las Vegas, at this flies west to east, but Las Vegas was not in the parabola path, and so Virginia was, and so it was the first one to have the opportunity of catching the signal. And power's gone, but it's gone, and it's gone on our side of the street, for Christ's sake. It, it's on across the street. <laughs> Go figure, you know? So, okay, so the guys are really panicked over there, and we're panicked. I mean, we're letting them panicked and, and so we're counting down here because it's coming it's coming boys get ready where are you and so the fortunately the power came on 10 minutes before they were to capture the target and they had they had strung electrical cords across the street to a restaurant <laughs> and so we were they were preparing themselves and and uh, God bless them you know they, they weren't going to lose this sucker so uh, they captured signal and uh, everybody cheered and and we're all this time and so anyway uh, part of our interesting uh, life right now is learning how to behave as a mission control facility and that's a really uh, interesting dynamic for us and how to to look at these pictures and and uh, and so on <clears throat> we have um, some signal interruption that's in the process of being cured. We have a, a torsion rods and, and magnetic rods that uh, are passed instead of using motors to uh, achieve attitude control, we're using these other mechanisms to stabilize the spacecraft. If we did uh, uh, neither, after about a half a year, the, the spacecraft would tend to stabilize itself. But we don't want to wait that long because our S-band antenna is the big throughput window that, that we have, and that's what gives us the best crisp pictures that, uh, that we can receive. Um, so the spacecraft was experiencing <clears throat> a end over end roll and this roll is very slow it takes six minutes to make one revolution I, I can't even move that slowly you know but six minutes is a long time it's also doing a horizontal roll which we do want because we, that, that creates a more of an ambient uh, friendly user friendly temperature arrangement so and it takes one hour for, for the spacecraft to make a roll horizontally like this and that's what you do want you want to be able to have this minus 250 Fahrenheit plus 250 degree Fahrenheit influence mitigated as best you can. So, and that, of course, we have identical antenna systems on either end of the airlocks. So when you're pointing down, we're, we're in direct line here as far as UHF, VHF is actually able to, to cover a broader signal path. The S-band is more signal specific. It's more target specific. So <clears throat> it's, uh, when, when you're in a, where the constant section, oops, where the constant section is facing uh, our, our signals aren't as strong, and so we're trying to get the attitude of the spacecraft to fly either one way or the other, uh, so it's pointing down toward, toward the Earth. Um, these other antennas in Hawaii and Fairbanks are all S-band antennas, and then we're hoping to move to X-band uh, perhaps late this year or next year, and that gives us uh, some more opportunity of throughput. Uh, so um, I, think, uh, I think that's... Um, most of the topics I had in mind. Okay, thank you again. Thank you.